it ends. Everything ends. Time and the world is over. And we begin eternity. Forever and ever. Amen. 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 Nah. Nah. Yep. Nah. Nah to the final victory of heaven on earth. Sorry, just not seeing it this time. Pass. And may I ask why you're not seeing it? Surely. Why? I told you you could ask. However, I am the only First Order Archangel in the room, or, you know, the universe. So I'm not going to answer so much. But you feel free to knock yourself out with all the asking. Anyway, Armageddon, the sequel, that's a nan. What's next on the agenda? The cleaning roster. Okay. Hey, panelers, welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And I'm Laura. And this episode, we are going to be wrapping up our Good Omen Season 2 coverage uh, with covering basically episodes 5 and 6. That was the last of it. It was a brilliant show and it was fun. Uh, we'll go really deep into this. We're probably not going to schedule out like points and like top fives and things of that nature. And it's, it's probably going to be more of a free form kind of episode in comparison to what we've done before. The one cool thing about this, or maybe it's not cool because it kind of lost me at times and it kind of both episodes blended in because there was no mini sods. Yeah. Oh yeah. So it, it, the distraction of the mini sode was not there for these two, last two episodes, I've noticed. So it concentrated more on the overall story of both the Xerophil, Crowley, and and everybody else that, that was uh, represented, even Gabriel himself uh, in the uh, the bookstore, as well as the Hell and Heaven. <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah, so I figured, all right, well, let, let's just do that that way, because even Laura brought it up earlier before we started recording and i said you know what let's just do it as they, they kind of blend in yeah we'll i just made live a, yeah <laughs> i just made a note for myself when we do get to six to make a comment about the the mini sodes because yeah, I we could do that they, I, I think they explain it i think it gets explained in episode six. Oh, why we didn't get episode why we didn't get mini sodes in this one kind of or like what the mini sodes were i think that's explained in episode six i just picked up on that tonight when my when i rewatched both episodes so Perfect. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll start. And obviously, ladies and gentlemen, listeners, we're covering Good Omen Season 2, Episode 5 and 6. Uh, five Episode 5 is entitled Chapter 5, The Ball. And Episode 6 is entitled Chapter 6, Every Day, if I'm correct. Yep, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're right. All right. Yeah, because I saw a few before. It's like, all right, I, I wasn't going according to my Amazon Prime. <sighs> so I'll pause it and then I'll just type down the yeah. synopsis and, and title itself. But yeah. And like I said before, they both blend in so easily because mm -hmm. the synopsis for part five is Zerafel tries to bring Maggie and Nina together. Shax is determined to, to launch a full scale attack on the bookshop. And Gabriel has a close encounter with Mrs. Sandwich. He certainly did. <laughs> so, and then uh, the synopsis for uh, episode six is Curly becomes a heavenly bee and learns the truth about the Armageddon sequel. Aziraphil defends his bookshop from Shax's army and reveals his halo. Maggie and Nina become warriors, and Jim, the assistant bookseller, gets some hot chocolate. Curly and Aziraphil get the bottom of the mystery of the matchbox. The, the Metatron bringing, uh, brings an oat milk latte along with the final offer. So mm -hmm. it's, like I said, the, the reason why they do, because if you watch them in one sitting, you feel like you're watching the same episode because of everything takes place literally within the bookstore. And then it, they take a, a quick side road to go into heaven at mm -hmm. a certain point with Crowley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have a staff meeting in hell. The yeah. staff meeting from hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, from hell. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That was great. And I'll, I'll throw it in since you went ahead and gave the, uh, the synopsis for episode six about the Met and mentioned the Metatron. Yeah. He says 
towards the end of episode six, and this is kind of getting ahead of ourselves, but he says, he tells uh, Aziraphale, I dropped into your life at different times to see your partnerships with Crowley. And I think those are meant to be the minisodes that we saw were those moments when Metatron dropped into the, their life. And maybe even all of season one could have been a Metatron viewing of them. Very hmm. much. Yeah. That's so, interesting. I, they, I because they do that. a whole recap at the very end. And you see when Gabriel is getting his memories back from the fly in his eye, you see everything encounters that he has. So I would include that as well because he was yeah. a major part of that. Yeah, it just, it was one of those moments where when I was watching it tonight and he said that, I was like, oh, that's what the minisodes were. The minisodes were Metatron seeing them together uh, and then realizing to make this off the offer that he makes, which we'll talk about later. Yeah, yeah good catch. It sounds to me like uh, he was just watching over their, over the course of centuries and eons, the, uh, yeah. Their <laughs> their friendship and how they were able to that that odd connection that they have that we always talk about, yeah, mm-hmm. which is pretty cool. And it seems like somebody's always been there watching over them, as it were. Uh, I don't think they're a Slayer, a Highlander, or anything like that, but <laughs> <laughs> they have somebody watching them. <laughs> For sure, yeah. yeah. I liked the, you know, the very beginning of episode five when uh, Shax is there and she's talking to Furfur. And you remember, she treated Furfur very, very poorly earlier in the season. And mm-hmm. uh, so now he has the kind of tables are turned when he's like, she's like, I have the full power of Beelzebub and permission. I want 10,000 demons. And he's like, mm, no, you can't get that many. And she's like, okay, then a thousand. Nope, you can't get that many. Uh, uh, I can give you a hundred. And then she says something else and he goes, now it's down to 70. So, <laughs> <laughs> so just like, uh, the rest of the country, hell has a, uh, staffing issue. <laughs> exactly. They just can't find any good employees. Exactly. Yeah. And what was the deal with the, uh, the spiked Afro? Were there several spiked Afro demons or was it just one? Cause it seemed like she, that's the demon she, Eric. I love she just, it. <laughs> she just, she just keeps him. dying and coming back. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, what did she do? She like destroyed him. And then, and then he, he comes back later and then he's the first one through the door when they're able to get through the door in episode six. He's also the first one that gets destroyed by the, the discoporeal thing. I don't think we see him after the discoporeal thing. No. But, mm. uh, but you'll remember he was in season one and ha- there were, uh, I think, three of him and Haster oh. killed all three of them. Well, he killed all of them, but the last one. And then the okay. last one, he laughed at his joke. <laughs> okay. So maybe maybe that's just a recurring theme. So Yeah. Okay. I think it's just a gag that he, he's constantly showing up no matter how. He's, uh, he's like Kenny from South Park, you know? Yeah. <laughs> he just dies and shows up again. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Killed Eric. I got it. That's, uh, that's good. <laughs> his name is Eric. His name is Demon Eric. I actually looked it up. <laughs> Demon Eric. <laughs> oh, that's, why was I, I? I was thinking Kenny was Eric. I'm like, ah, okay, never mind. <laughs> Instead of I killed Kenny, it was I killed Eric. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just love the fact that the, the a majority of the episode is the the setup of them having their uh, storekeepers meeting in the mm-hmm. bookstore. Mm-hmm. And the way Aziraphale mentions it later on, that it is, you know, the, the demons can't get in from hell because it's still considered an embassy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, just like anything like a vampire, they have to be invited in. Yep. <laughs> and yeah. then somebody screws that up. And I think it was Maggie and Nina. <laughs> yeah. At least that's what they believe. I, I think Shax and the demons believe they have to be let in but they never actually attempt going in without an invite yeah they're gullible (laughs) it's so funny you say it that way lara because i remember years ago and this is getting off on a tangent but there was a series of vampire books from the 80s where that was exactly what had happened the like the vatican and like the vampire the early vampires had gotten together and they figured out these rules and they just had passed them down through the that they that the cross not being able to enter all these things were actually not true. And it's not until like a, a modern person gets turned into a vampire that they're like, did anybody ever test it? And the guy <laughs> she's with is like, is like, 
well, no, we just, it's just always been that way. And so she figures out that it was a, you know, I, and I've not been able to remember what that series of books was. So if anybody remembers that series of books or can think of it, please write in and tell us listeners, because I have completely forgotten what that series of books was. I read it when I was a young man and that's all I remember. You would think that's where they got that from what they do in the shadows. It's something that they would do to pull the wool over people's faces. Like all this time <laughs> we could have just walked in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just, I, it just, it's so funny. You brought that up that way, but yeah. And it's, it's, it's really cool. You you mentioned Laura, the staff meeting from hell where or the staff meeting in hell, where <laughs> Eric keeps holding up his hand and asking, him, we're not really a legion, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> And then they're in this huge uh, empty warehouse because she was expecting a legion of 10,000 demons and she got 70. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, the the rest of the demons are sitting there going, could this have been an email? Yeah. They didn't even need 70. If you think about it, there weren't really that many people in that, and in that bookstore. So really for them to take over, they really didn't need 70. Yeah. <laughs> well, they weren't all that bright so you know yeah. a lot of them yeah. got got easily taken out yeah that surrender the angle <laughs> <laughs> yeah i love that's the other thing they throw the they throw the piece of wood or whatever through the window and it's like surrender the angle and crowley's like yeah they're not they're not great spellers and then later shacks is like they'll be toast t-o-s-t-e <laughs> yeah toast that There's was a great gag yeah, there's your new Duke of Hell. <laughs> Miranda Richardson is really great. I mean, I thought it was a little confusing at first when she came back, not as Mrs. Madam Tracy. I'm like, what happened to Madam Tracy? She become a demon or something? But no, she's just a totally new character. But this is really fun. She got to play an entirely new character, and she yeah. she killed it. Very cool. I find it odd that the – I don't know if you guys noticed, but I noticed that the people from Hell, Beelzebub, everybody, Shax, they look cleaner when they're on Earth or in this mm-hmm. particular episode in comparison. Usually yeah. Beelzebub has like dirt, a ton of flies and gnats around her. Yeah, she's usually got sores, open wounds and stuff yeah, on her this, face. In this case, they're cleaner. And I'm like, w- w- what's the difference? It's because they're on Earth. <laughs> I think it is. Yeah, for them to pass as human. And those few that really had messed up had to put masks on. I thought that was I thought it was a cool COVID kind of callback. For them to have the demons mm-hmm. that had messed up lower faces wearing surgical masks and things to, yeah. <laughs> to hide their face. Exactly. That was funny, too. I love when he uh, Curly goes up and pulls down the mask and he's like, you're demons, junior league demons at that bottom of the barrel. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, love and going back to, the, like you said, the beginning of episode five, when uh, when Aziraphel is going around getting the other shopkeepers and, you know, he's got a bribe. He's got a couple of them that he has to bribe and he does that whole Doctor Who annual 1965. And the guy's like, no, there never was a, a oh, annual yeah. 1965. It was 1966. And he's like, well, I have the only proof copy from September 1965, you know, and the other guy is going to get a book that was signed by somebody in their real name. I missed that on this watch. Do you guys remember what that was? There's something about, I think it was a magician, but I didn't get the name. I'm assuming a well-known magician because Neil Gaiman loves to sprinkle in those real life bits of history. Okay. Yeah. It was definitely a magician that that was the autograph on it. Okay. And it was, and he said it was his real name. So, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is also a nod to wizards and magicians, you know, hiding their real name. And you can't let anyone know your real names. (laughs) <laughs> also a nod to uh tenant because he was a doctor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, the but. doctor who. Yep. Well, that also, and that, that comes back to when they're talking about the little, the fly, when she says it's bigger on the inside. Yep. <laughs> That's another doctor. <laughs> yeah. Who yeah. Back. Because it's something you could put something in there. Yeah. Uh, and it was meant to be storage unit. And then they leave it off where he drops the matchbook and you don't know what the significance of it after, until we go back to it later on. Right. Then you yeah. realize it's like, oh, okay, the fly was in the matchbook. I feel so stupid. The first time the first time I watched it and Mrs. Sandwich is talking about her job and she's calling it a seamstress because she doesn't want to say that she's an escort. She's got an escort cat house. You know, <laughs> she's talking about – I thought it was because of the spell that Aziraphale had, had put over them like with the dancing and acting all Puritan. But then I was like, whoa, she's probably just hiding her actual profession. <laughs> you know? No, I think it was because she kept saying, why can't I say that I'm a – 
seamstress. Seems, yeah. okay. She she was try it reminded me a lot of the good place if you've ever seen that mm-hmm. sitcom where they end up in heaven or the good place and uh ev- they can never say anything r- poorly they can't they can't swear so every time they try and say something it'll say what the fork is this shirt right yeah yeah okay so maybe it was it, that whole spell was really cool making them dance and uh, that whole thing with the ball where we have a, again we have just this Aziraphale going back to Jane Austen saying that well that's just how people fall in love they have to be at a dance and have mm-hmm. a ball going on so it's so charming although I really wish that everyone who was in the bookshop had changed into Regency clothes. You saw M- Madam Sandwich did and so a few of the other guests, but then some of them didn't. And I thought that was a little strange. I'm like, I thought it would be great if everyone walked in and they were suddenly dressed like they just walked off the set of a Jane Austen movie. Yeah, it was a little, I was, that's why I was uncertain about the whole, whether she was under a spell or not. Cause I was like, well, some people are, and some people are talking funny, but then some aren't. And like later, the guy pulls out his in episode six. The guy pulls out his phone. He's like, "I'm going to dial emergency services," and you hear him dialing the nine nine nine, which is the emergency services in the UK, not nine one one, because you can hear the same tone that he's hitting the, and it's the same tone, the same deep tone that he's hitting every time. I noticed that in this watch. So that poor fella, <laughs> but he came back. He came and you back. know, nothing happened. Nothing good happened because you, after you see him flying through the crowd of demons, you hear a squelching noise in the background. Yeah. And then like the newspaper that he's holding at the end of episode six has got like burn marks on it and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. He may have been pulled down to hell at some point. Yeah. That guy's going to need some therapy. (laughs) They all forgot what happened pretty much. Yeah. (laughs) Because the next day they're standing in line at the coffee shop and they... None of them, other than Maggie and Nina, seem to have a clue as what happened at the bookshop. Right. I also like the Gabriel and Beelzebub meeting. Mm-hmm. And literally, it's just like them meeting at the same places. It's uh, callbacks to what we've seen before. Everything was foreshadowed at, at certain points. And I forgot what the name of the, the pub was called. The Resurrectionists. The Resurrectionists. It, there you yeah, go. The first, yeah, the first time they meet, it's it's just a bar. And then the next time they meet, it's the Resurrectionists. And that's when they have the match. The whole, he changes the, the jukebox. Yeah, because the yeah. first time they met there, the jukebox was playing every day. And the second time they meet there. I love to see the progression of that relationship as they're showing it to us and realizing that, you know, Beelzebub makes the point that we can't meet in hell or we can't meet in our regular places because they'll know that we're collaborating. And yeah. like, we get that flashback where he doesn't recognize her the first time they meet. Uh, and he's like, yeah, you're, I'm waiting for someone. <laughs> She's like, no, I'm the person you're waiting for. You know, that was their first time collaborating, trying to figure out apocalypse or what did he say? Uh, Arma, Arma, not getting or <laughs> uh-huh. no apocalypse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Arma bloody getting <laughs> no Armageddon. And it's funny how we we get Armageddon again because it's what they stopped last season, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. literally. And then yeah. this is it's the same thing again. So they have to constantly stop this at all costs. It's the same thing, but the other side of the coin. Yeah, the last Armageddon was going to be the coming of the Son of Satan, and this time it's going to be the Second Coming. And I believe right. did Crowley say, you know, it doesn't matter if it's your side or our side. People are going to die anyhow. Right. Yeah. Depending on what you believe uh, as far as what's going to happen towards the end of the the, the end times. Yeah. When when yes. Metatron says we're, we're planning for the second coming, he's talking about the second coming of Jesus. And uh, that does include an Armageddon at some point. Uh, mm. Either way, it's still going to happen. <laughs> yeah. There's going to be some sort of, but it's not going to be the end of all time. It's not going to be a destruction yeah. of everything. So that's the, that, that's kind of where I, I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on the details of what they're going to, what the show is going to do for us. Cause I, they've got to have a season three. I, I can't, I know mm-hmm. we're in a writer's strike right now, but I know eventually whether it's in 2025 or 2024 or whatever, hopefully we're going to get a season three to, to wrap this up. Well, yeah. Neil Gaiman has said that even if they don't renew for a third season, which I can't see Amazon Prime not doing with how successful both seasons has has mm-hmm. been, he said that he would still write it in a novel form. Okay. And if we're lucky, we'll get everyone co- coming back to do the audio. But I would right. much rather be able to see the series. Yeah. So we've got to keep our fingers crossed. Mm-hmm. Well, 
considering I, I believe Prime has made a lot of numbers when it came to not only the season but the first season. And that's the reason why we have season two. I would have put wouldn't put it past them that if they would uh, green light it again because it was so successful. Mm-hmm. Now it's just a matter. Yeah, but there will definitely be an audio book too if he puts it out in book form. So mm-hmm. a lot of the stuff I think with his contracts, he's allowed to put that into writing as well. And then keep that. And most likely it's all licensing within since it's Amazon, they just link it and they just sell it directly through their own. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, apparently before Terry Pratchett passed away in 2015, they had written out notes for a sequel. So this is not the actual sequel that they had written out, but they had yeah. outlined where they wanted a sequel to go if there was going to be another one. And I think Neil worked with the producers this time to kind of build up a little backstory as to how that sequel would go. And then if we do get a third season, I believe that's going to be the actual outline that Terry and Neil had worked on together. Oh, okay. That'll be interesting to see how that uh, same here, especially, especially in light of the changing relationship sort of between Crowley and Aziraphale that we have this parting of the ways Mm -hmm. kind of thing you know oh yeah i think uh if we leave the story how it is now there's going to be many many broken hearts out there a lot of fan fiction i'm sure will be will be written though (laughs) i'm sure there's already fan fiction. it's already out there there, i'm certain (laughs) (laughs) just look for reddit and then be subreddits to links to other (laughs) websites and i'm sure there's like a a ton of how crowley and xerophel are lovers or they're their friendship has gone through eons later and or side stories that they created that get involved within like probably other Bible stories that, that we ha- they haven't even covered. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, I just was saying it was going to be interesting to see where they, where they go with it and what they do with it. Yeah. I'm always interested. The characters themselves are the one thing that attracts everybody. Clara, like you said, the last episode when we were covering three and four, he was saying that, you know, the first season that was written beginning to end as a full story, whereas this particular season, we had many sods that were involved in it and kind of breaking up. And like I, I said, on uh, just in the beginning of this, I kind of missed the mini sods, even though it was a little distracting at times. Mm-hmm. But you, once they take it away, you want more of it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, while we're in the future, in the current timeline, we mm-hmm. don't get the minisode. So I think they wanted to bookend that because we the first episode didn't have a minisode. Yeah. And then the last two didn't because we're we're back in present time. Yeah. Very almost similar to what we got with uh, in Sandman, because we got the it was it was an unofficial last episode, but there was two stories involved in that one. Right. Mm-hmm. If uh, if you guys watch the first season of Sandman that, that came out on Netflix. So if they do more more things like that, if Neil is going to be writing more like that in that context, I'd like to see it a little bit more like that because it still keeps to the major part of the story, but it still has its own little side story nonetheless. Mm-hmm. So you could say, I didn't like this aspect, but I really like this one. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I like that. that. And then you could easily just, just watch one if you wanted to. If you're a fan of that. Here's a theory that I was thinking about or have been thinking about. So we get it mentioned a couple of times in both episode five and six when Crowley goes to talk to Jim, short for James, short for Gabriel. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) he's talking to him and Gabe, he's forcing Gabriel to try to remember uh, mm-hmm. why you know what it is that he he forgot and gabriel's trying trying and trying and then he he happens to mention if it happens again it will look like it's an institutional problem so this is something that the metatron also recounts in heaven when they're having gabriel's trial he's saying if you know it's it's happened once before if it happens again it's an institutional problem so this is my theory, and my daughter and I have somewhat different theories on it, but my theory is that what if Crowley is actually Lucifer, because he was a high-level archangel who was tossed down to hell, and they can't do that again with Gabriel. That's why they try and demote him to like a level 38 <laughs> bookkeeping angel, basically just below Muriel. So 
because I have a feeling that Crowley is his demon name, but he was another high-ranking angel when he was in heaven, because obviously he was pretty instrumental in the design of the universe there as he's turning on the universe at the very beginning, first episode. What do you guys think? Honestly, I thought about that a lot, like not this season when I first saw the first season. I, I thought about that because I'm like, wait a minute, this, they mention a hierarchy devil that's in charge of hell, but they, you know, they, they don't talk about Lucifer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's what, uh, what happened to uh, the favorite angel that fell from earth or, or fell from the sky or fell from heaven. That that could be him because we've seen it over and over that he's done all these things and he's still mischievous himself. Yeah, yeah I, I know. I, I know. I was a little confused about that when, and so your theory, Laura, I'm, I'm turning it over to my brain right now as I'm trying to think about it. Cause I, I suspected there was something cause there was something more to Crowley than he is because Muriel says, I can't open it only a throne level or dominion level. I think is what she says mm -hmm. can open it. And then he just flips it open without even a thought really. He just says, oh, they never changed their passwords. And yep. I kind of went, well, wait a minute. Does that mean he was a higher level than what Aziraphale was? And that would also make sense why he doesn't want to go back to, he doesn't want to go back to heaven being less than, less than an archangel. Right. Yeah. I mean, that would mm -hmm. make, that would make sense. But also they do mention Satan at the end yeah. of episode six, because they said, we'll report back to Satan about this. Mm -hmm. So um, we do have Satan who was in the first first season. season. Right. Yeah. And you know, he was the gi the gigantic Benedict Cumberbatch. Um but um and I know at least in Paradise Lost, which I believe Neil Gaiman gets a lot of his inspiration for this and parts of Sandman from yeah. Paradise Lost, John mm -hmm. Milton's Paradise Lost. Yeah. Um Lucifer is thrown down to hell and becomes Satan, but what if I don't know. I don't know. I'm thinking about Neil Gaiman's brain. <laughs> I'm like, is it possible that Lucifer was different than Satan, and and or he's just having Satan, like right. kind of cover for him so he can lay low or something? Yeah, because well, like in, in yeah. our Bible, in our Bible, Satan and, and Lucifer they're synonymous with each mm -hmm. other. They are the they're same. the same. Yes. But in yeah. but it's it's very possible that in Neil Gaiman's world they're not the same, and and Satan could be just another fallen. Mm -hmm. angel you mm -hmm. know because i mean we do d again depending on what you believe from the bible a third of the angels fell and mm -hmm. a, a third of a lot uh, is a lot let me see let me do the math a lot from a lot is it's still a lot. a lot yeah yeah so <laughs> i'm doing the math there it's that's how the math works out um <laughs> so that's an interesting theory that, that crowley could be that prince of that prince of heaven yeah. That they're mm -hmm. talking about uh, when they mention that. That is that is interesting. I can. And also, I think, was it in the very first episode, Crowley says, Oh, you can't get in trouble for asking questions. And that's <laughs> what they say that, you know, Lucifer <laughs> was thrown from heaven because he was questioning God's plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. and well, and that's what Metatron says at the end of the episode. He says, Your friend was, was thrown out for asking too many questions. And mm -hmm. he's like, That's why he wants yeah. to. That's why he wants to promote, sort of promote Aziraphale, because he's like, you're not somebody who asks questions, mm -mm. but you're somebody that will lead. I I really felt like the first time I watched it, I didn't pick up on this, but at the in this second watch of it, I really felt the insincerity of what mm -hmm. Metatron is telling, that he's like buttering up Aziraphale. Like, it's not that he really wants Aziraphale to be the Archangel. He just wants somebody that he can kind of manipulate and, yes. and direct yeah. was was uh, kind of the impression I got in this second this second viewing. Mm. The thing about Aziraphale is that he's so sweet. I mean, he is what a, what the epitome of an angel should be. You know, he's kind, he's good hearted, he believes in the best in everybody, and he really doesn't see the hypocrisy of the angels and the Metatron until Crowley starts to point it out to him, you know? Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, the Metatron was a jerk in season one, and he's a jerk in this season. 
<laughs> he's no Alan Rickman, I'll tell you that. No, he's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he definitely isn't Alan Rickman, <laughs> and he's not Booger either from uh, <laughs> <laughs> Revenge of the Nerds. Uh, what's the, the Curtis Armstrong? Curtis, Curtis Armstrong. Yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah, he played Metatron in the Supernatural TV series. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he did. So, yeah, that's that's the only reason why I knew what the name meant because I was like, oh, the Metatron, the scribe of God, the the person listening to God's ear, and that was played by Curtis Armstrong in Supernatural. So yeah. The funny thing about the whole Lucifer Satan thing, I think the the whole thing about Satan and Gaiman's idea of Satan is literally it's kind of like a role in hell that somebody has to take on. Mm. And so in, it's like instead of general, they're listed as Satan. So Lucifer at a certain point could be have been Satan at one point, but he has too many questions, got thrown out of heaven and stuck on Earth forever. You haven't and, been reading ahead on the Sandman, have you, Mark? No, I have not. <laughs> That's just a little drop. I'm not giving any spoilers away. Well, we have a while until we get to San- season two. <laughs> uh, and that can be found on podcast, everybody. But my feeling is, is that I think with Gaiman is that the, these are different. Uh, like, he's just a general. And then anybody can become any demon can become Satan as long as they're it's because it's if you look at how they portrayed hell. It's almost like a business structure mm-hmm. anyway. So you have a CFO, a CEO, you yeah. have your supervisor, you have everybody, you know, Shax is one of them. Lucifer apparently was one, uh, like some mm-hmm. sort of weird supervisor there as well. So, I mean, Crowley himself was uh, definitely one of them, but we don't know exactly what his title was. And then they kind of have that within heaven as well. So obviously yeah, bit, Gabriel oh, is the, the, yeah. the, the big honcho. And I love how Crowley winds up getting, oh, I forget her name. He uh, The one who says that she's a detective policeman. Oh, Muriel. Muriel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. As she, he gets inspector her. Inspector officer or officer inspector. inspector. Of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the fact that he's able to get her, to arrest him <laughs> to take him yeah. to go up to heaven of all things. And the the look of uh, Crowley in heaven when he does his little quick disguise, and it didn't really, it wasn't fitting to me to see David Tennant look like that. He didn't look <laughs> like he fit in heaven, honestly. Well, yeah, and he couldn't. You notice he couldn't go like a full white suit. It was more of like a beige, a yeah. beige suit, and his hair was still red, although it was slicked back instead of up in that weird Ed Grimley. Q. Yeah, yeah, Ed Grimley looking <laughs> the pompadour. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he still had his sunglasses on. So it was. It you know, seemed um, like a fluorescent uh, light in, in heaven to the point where you see every welt, m- mark, <laughs> pimple, zit, scar, anything you had on you because it was so bright. You're like, oh, is it me or did ten- Tenet look like age up a bit when as soon as you got to heaven? Yeah, yeah. Because he couldn't get, he couldn't get quite white suits. <laughs> I thought that was funny when you mentioned the hierarchy of business in heaven, because there's a funny little scene and you can barely, you barely missed it. I had to turn on the closed captioning to hear what it says. But after Gabriel and Beelzebub take off, Michael is trying to make decisions for everyone. And she's going like, with Gabriel gone, I'm now the archangel of heaven. And Uriel's just standing, not Muriel, Uriel, her her sort of, yeah, right hand angel was standing over in the corner and said, Deputy chief. Yeah, deputy chief, like, like assistant <laughs> to the manager. No, no, you're not the manager. You're the assistant to the manager. So yeah, I, I, I caught I caught that in this second, the second watch that she's like Michael has just decided to promote herself. Mm-hmm. And all of how the Metatron walks in and is like, no, you can't do that. Like <laughs> Now, the first time I saw that scene, I did not understand why they couldn't recognize the Metatron, especially because he was in the in the um the, the trial for Gabriel and he's walking in and they're just all looking at, at him like, Who are you? And they're completely confused. But my daughter and Derek and John on TV podcast industries straightened it out for me. It's it's just a joke. The whole thing is that they every time they see the Metatron, he's a giant glowing head. So when he actually comes in with a body and clothing, right. they don't recognize him. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes, well, and that's like, I, and now your theory about Crowley makes more sense, even more sense now that, because uh, Crowley makes the makes the point of whenever he's like, 
wait, that's Gabriel. And he's like, yeah, we did a miracle to hide him. And apparently we did it too good to where we hide him from everybody. Like the demons <laughs> didn't even know that it was Gabriel when they sent him out to them. Yes. And uh, I was like going, now that makes sense of why if he's a, a former archangel, he has that spark in him that would that would explain the excessive power that was used in their in their miracle because that was never explained why is their miracle so gig- ginormous when they i'm still going Gabriel? to believe that it's because of the two of them because they're just adorable together <laughs> <laughs> and their their love created the spark <laughs> could be could be too did you find that story was that a how do i phrase this without sounding puritanical did, like i never picked up on a romantic love between the two of them like even now i still can't really wrap my head around their friendship i thought it was out of respect more than anything a lot of people i've had people say to me uh, it it sounds to me like they're lovers or they're distant lovers or uh unrequited married couple (laughs) oh yeah and i'm like no they're just good friends that care about each other and i i I think it's just the way their view of how Mike and Michael Sheen presents himself as a Xerophel and his mannerisms and the way he talks. And I'm like, mm, no, I don't see it. But I said, play again. <laughs> Come play if again. If you read the book, and I read it 30 years ago, but my daughter's reading it through now. Yeah. There are definite sort of romantic overtones. Overtones. And Neil Gaiman even kind of said, you know, it's it's kind of up to the reader to decide to what level that romance is and it was kind of tipped off in season one as well when um crowley and Zarafel were having a, a fight out on the street and uh they kind of huff off and and he's like i'm not coming back and uh there's a man on the street who walks by a Zarafel. he's like you're better off without him and then <laughs> walks off so <laughs> Yeah, I think there it, it, hints have been dropped yeah okay i just it's just i don't like <sighs> I don't like see I have, it. <laughs> I don't I, thank you, Mark. I'm glad somebody else doesn't see it. Cause I don't, cause I have friends. I have male friends of mine that I've been friends with for 20, 30 years that we have similar arguments or discussions a, a lot of times. And there's no, there's not any sort of romantic between us. Mm-hmm. So like it, the, just the fact that it seems like some, and we, Mark and I, Mark and I talked about this, Gosh, what show was it where they had two female protagonists? Oh, um, oh uh, Sheil with Nikki and uh, yeah. and, and Sheil that they they're just friends. They're not they're not a romantic yeah. couple, and the show never took it to that point because I, I shows so many times. Um, Rizzoli and Isles uh, did it. They went through their whole their whole series, and they didn't have to make the leads romantically involved. They can just like like males and females can be platonically friends without having to put a role i don't know why so many times movies and television shows yeah yeah just like yeah you know, it's like when people go oh tango and cash really <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's like somebody it's, said that to me they're like i'm like well maybe a modern day turnaround they'll change that to it but i don't see it happening <laughs> yeah well, it was no. I don't know. It was in the books for, I mean, the book was ambiguous for 30 years. So maybe Neil Gaiman just wanted to make it part of the canon that they maybe I read the book, a love for each other. I read the book when season one came out and I didn't pick up on that, but I'm not, again, I'm not really, I don't look for that. So it's, I'm not, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying I don't see it. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, I didn't see it when I read it, but that was when I was 19. So I might not have been looking for it either. Yeah, it's I, it's probably just people's interpretation of it, yeah. and everybody has their own view and insight of certain stories, honestly, and it's fine. Everybody mm-hmm. has that they that they have that right, you know. Everybody can read into whatever they want. It could be said by any version of any Bible of any religion. It, it's, it's subject to interpretation of what you think of what what it says to you. So. Uh, same thing with the characters with within a story. I'm sure uh, people have read uh, Pride and Prejudice. They would have the same feeling, just the same. <laughs> or or Little Women. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. like a whole bunch of them out there that you could bring up that are subjected to uh, interpretation. 
I, you know, I really hope I want to, I know we, uh, to get off this topic necessarily, uh, not necessarily to get off this topic, but to, to change topics a little bit. I'm excited. I'm really hoping that season three, they are able to get the cast back because I want to see Muriel running the bookshop on earth and how she's able to navigate and whether she ends up striking a, a friendship relationship with Maggie and Nina to help her kind of navigate earth. Cause you know, she's very much babe in the woods, whatever you want to call it, stranger in a strange land, doesn't know what's going on <laughs> yeah. uh, kind of thing. When we get a season three, I'm going to put that into existence. When we get a season, season three, I hope we get her back to see the progression of her character. And I have a feeling she's going to be extremely well-educated when she's spent an entire, who knows how long, many several months or so, <laughs> running the bookshop, because that mm-hmm. was so cruel of the Metatron to call her the dim one. The dim one, yeah. I was like, oh, that's not nice. Like, you're uh, a jerk. <laughs> Metatron is just a jerk. He's just got a big head. You know, he's the <laughs> real, real stubborn, mean cold-hearted secretary that sits outside of the executive's office and he's like nope doesn't want to talk to you today go away come back make an appointment for another day yeah mm. uh, so that cover anything... most of the things yeah that's most of the stuff that i'm trying to think of there's anything else that uh in this rewatch from episode five i thought it was cool the scene of aziraphale kind of setting up the bookshop for the dance and when the guy comes in who's like the runner or the head of the the guild or whatever it is the what did they call it the merc town the merc street i wrote it down. Merchant. oh thank you <laughs> crowley says it wrong a couple times as well it's the wickber streets wickbers 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 street traders and shopkeepers monthly meeting Okay. Yep. It, the guy who's kind of the head of that that whole thing, he's like, Where are the chairs that I that I sent over? And Seraphil's <laughs> like, Well, we would just have to move them out when the dancing started. And he's like, What dancing? You know. So I think it was great. Jim walking around carrying the little sandwiches and the food and Mrs. Sandwich going, Don't go far. I want another one of those. <laughs> and <laughs> just the and and we, you put this, this is actually in the the synopsis for episode five that the reaction that Mrs. Sandwich and that couple I guess they were a married couple because he says happy anniversary to her as they're walking out of the bookshop in yeah. episode six. But yep. uh, they all are just like fawning over Jim because he's just like so attractive. And I just think that's a <laughs> that's a huge play up on the fact that John Hamm is always getting at about how attractive and handsome he is. And, uh, <laughs> and so it was fun was... to get to see him play um, a comedic role again. I think a lot of people know him from Mad Men, but I haven't mm-hmm. watched that series. But I did watch Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. And he's yep. hilarious oh, in that. Yeah, I, as a I cult actually leader. just started watching that recently, and on and off, I'll throw it on. But it, he is funny as to and how he tries to avoid it, and then, uh, yeah, he, he's really his comedic style is is different. He's also in the new Fletch movie too. Yeah, so yeah, he I took never over watched Batman. Chevy Chase. Yeah, I never watched Mad Men either, so I only know him from Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt and just what I've heard about him from Mad Men, obviously, but. To, yeah, so seeing it when he's doing the whole mouth thing, and it's like, yeah, the, he goes, Oh, this is what I learned in bed. And you're like, Oh no, what is he gonna do? And then he starts the la 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 la. la. It's like, Oh, okay, he's making a n- noise with his mouth. And I was like, Okay, <laughs> he's like a little kid, <laughs> yeah. And I do love when he walked out because he, you know, he finally does something unselfish Angel-y. and walks out and and says here i am i'm gabriel and he has this fantastic like it's liberace style liberace. jacket on. yep exactly and they're like what are you doing get back in that bookshop and get us gabriel <laughs> yeah yeah, they yeah and he just he so out. solely he so solely walks it and just like slips that jacket off and just like <laughs> mm. <laughs> poor thing well you, there definitely is a big difference in contrast between gabriel and jim Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. you can tell which we all love Jim, but Gabriel could be a bit of a douche. And even like (laughs) in this last watch in episode six, when he gets his memories back, uh, it was it's so subtle. It just shows how good of an actor John Hamm is. It's Mm. so subtle. And I didn't notice it in the first watch, but I definitely noticed his features. Like when they show the, the, the archive footage of him from season one, he's very harsh. His face has a very harsh look to it. Yeah. Um, when he gets his memories back and he sees Beelzebub and he's just like, Hey you. And it's like, there's a softness 
to his yeah. to his face and to his eyes and you can see that he has changed he is not he is the not same. the guy yeah he's not the guy who said you know kill the angel in season one he's he's the guy who is standing in the, when they're talking about the apocalypse or armageddon and he's like nah not no he's not the one who told his air to shut his stupid mouth and die already that's it that's <laughs> probably him, yeah. one of same my guy. favorite lines from season one <laughs> yeah shut your yes. stupid mouth and die yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's, it, that's what they were fearful of crowley and his air oh yeah but it's crowley so was subtle. especially it's afraid just... of gabriel no. I just thought it was very impressive this time around. You could see his features change is the look in his eye is just, you can tell he's not the same Gabriel that we had from season one. So yeah, yeah. he's been changed by love. Yeah. And, and there's a bit of a change too, at the very end of this with, uh, within the last episode with Aziraphale, if you think about him with pulling off that whole halo trick. Oh yeah. We didn't talk about that. Yeah, we didn't talk about that, but that's pretty wild. I I forget where it came from. Did it come around his neck and he had to push it up? No, over his he, head? You know, he took it out. No, he took it off his forehead. He his he forehead. actually like it came off his forehead, and it was just like it looked like he was taking the top of his head off. Actually, yeah. yeah. The, the the CGI was really good, in my opinion, with that with him taking it off and throwing it onto the ground. And again, you see Eric is the one who his boot kind of touches it. So I guess we did see Eric after he was sucked up in the uh because he touches it with his boot and he's the first one to to blow up and then the, and he's like oh you did the halo thing crowley's Crowley's like what did you do and he goes i did the halo thing he's like you did the halo thing he's like, i think i started a war and yeah. you can see all the alarm bells going off everywhere and the demons are like somebody just started a war and, <laughs> and they're all happy about it too it's yeah. just so funny both the angels and the demons are happy. Oh, the war has started. And they get down there and Crowley's like, no, 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 there's no war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd throw that one in last yeah. minute. I, I forgot about it. I was like, oh, wait, we haven't talked about the, that. <laughs> uh, but I think that's so all should... I really. Go ahead. We should talk about the offer that um, the Metatron gives to Zarephel, though. So the Metatron proposes to Zarephel that he could take gabriel's place as high archangel and that he can pick anyone he wants as his second in command and azarafel's so excited about this so he goes to, into the bookshop and crowley's about to confront him about his feelings and he's like wait but i've got this proposition and just the two decisions were very interesting because you know crowley wants them to stay on earth he wants him to tell heaven to just shove it and we're gonna we're we're better off as a team here on Earth. And Azarafel so wants Crowley to accept the offer, become an angel again, and return to heaven. And I think it's you know, <laughs> from what I hear on the internets, a lot of people were pretty mad at Azarafel for making that offer and and thinking maybe they put something in um, that the Metatron put something in the in the coffee that he gave him, the latte that made him change his mind, but. I 100% think that that is a Zarephel. He is, yeah. as he, yeah. as Crowley called him, he's pure of heart. He doesn't believe in, he doesn't understand guile or deceit. And all he wants for the two of them is to be happy in heaven together. Well, and Crowley says something during that exchange that we didn't get that must have, if it, if he's telling the truth, it must have happened off screen because he says that they off, he, they offered him to go back to hell and he said no. He yeah, says that I to Zarephel. He says they offered to take me back as well. Yeah. And then Azarafel said something a bit demeaning. I mean, true, yeah. but demeaning and said, but of course you wouldn't go back to hell. They're the bad guys. Right. And I think he just doesn't, he's not seeing as a uh, Crowley for who he is. And, you know, I think a lot of people are upset about that, but I think that Azarafel just said it because he, he truly believes that he can get in and in, into this sort of corrupt system and make a change and that they can make a change together. And he, he's, he's hoping for the best. He's being, you know, blindly optimistic about it where Crowley kind of sees what the truth is going to be is that mm -hmm. they're just manipulating him and, and they're going to try and use him in some fashion. But that, you know, the, the whole point of them not admitting their feelings to each other is that Nina and, Maggie said, you guys don't communicate with each other. And right there, I was like, you guys aren't communicating with each other, Crowley. You need to tell Azarafel they're just using you. They don't really want you to be the 
archangel. They just want someone that they can easily manipulate. So, yeah. And I don't know if at that point, if, if because really we don't know that Aziraphale has said yes. He, he hadn't said yes at that point. Right. Because mm-hmm. Metatron sends him back into the, says, you don't need to answer me now. Take some time. Go talk to your friend. Mm-hmm. And, and then it's not until Crowley leaves and Oh, well, because Crowley says you did. You told him no, right? You didn't tell him yes, and we never hear Aziraphale. Azir, wrap my head around that name, Aziraphale. We <laughs> never hear him say yes. I I told him yes, or yes, I told him no. Mm-hmm. I just that was a really weird sentence to speak. He never says that. It's not until Crowley leaves and Metatron comes back in to the bookshop that. We never really have, we never hear Aziraphale accept the offer, mm. not verbally anyway. We just see him get into the elevator and, and Metatron says, oh, I turned the bookshop over to Muriel and now we need to go to heaven. And so I, I don't know if that's kind of, maybe it's a metaphorical, yes, him stepping into the elevator. He doesn't actually have yeah. to say the, say the words. I'm trying to remember. I don't remember him actually saying, yes, I'll take the job, but I think it's just, you know, he, he, he hymns and haws for a bit, worried about his bookshop and and all of this. And then he sees, I think he sees Crowley through the window. And then he walks out because he's just, I don't know if he's too broken hearted or what, but he's she's just decided then that he's he's got, you know, plans to try and improve a broken system. Although I do wonder if he comes up with an idea, because as they're rolling the credits at the end and you see the two side by side and mm-hmm. Crowley's driving away in the Bentley and he's going up to heaven, he does get a bit of a smile on his face. So wondering if he's thinking of some sort of plan. It's it's going to be interesting. I watched that whole ending because I was waiting to see if there was an end credit scene that I maybe missed there. But no, you're. it just shows the two of them side by side and then it goes to black at one point or and the music just keeps playing. But uh yeah, it's just it's it, that ending is is a, a little ambiguous at the same time as them. Yeah, I uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they how they wrap this up and or if they wrap it up in a third season if it's just three seasons or if they try to do a fourth. I don't know. Yeah, and I did post that I was going to be on tonight. Asked if anyone had any feedback, and my friend Lindsay did say that she didn't like the ending. So I, I just that. responded and said, yeah, well, I really hope that we're going to get a season three that's going to resolve that ending. And, yeah. you know, it obviously has to be resolved in some way. Yeah. Did we get any feedback, Mark? Or No, I, we didn't get anything. I threw that up last minute <laughs> with the picture, yeah, I, I which I'll be using posts. for the uh, for the video for uh, YouTube. But that, yeah. But even still, I'll, I it's not the first time I've heard somebody saying they, they weren't happy about it. Maybe they'll face it. Maybe it was kind of like those. It, it's like a transition to go into season three. And mm-hmm. they, they leave it off at that way. There's mm-hmm. a lot of uh, shows have done that where it just kind of like, oh, they kind of left it not hanging, but dwindling where it could go somewhere like to be continued. And they kind of work it off. And then there's some that just completely end there. Yeah. Like, well, well we know. World. We- <laughs> yeah, well, we know where I'm not even going to talk about Westworld. We know <laughs> we we know that that Aziraphale is going up to heaven to supposedly be the archangel, and it's going to be interesting to see how Michael and the others react to that. We have no idea what Crowley's going to do. He just asked if he's going to have his apartment back. Yeah. You know, if Shax is going to take Beelzebub's place, he's like, "Can I have my flat back? I'm tired of living in my car. Although living in my car is probably better than going to hell or something like that." And so it's 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 it's, it's going to be. I'm really interested and hope that we get a season three that we can sink our teeth into what this is yeah. going to be. Same here. And that was quite a ringer at the end because I did not expect them to have that kind of an ending. You know, yeah. I the Metatron takes uh, Azarafel and they go for coffee, and Crowley talks about going and having what an extremely alcoholic brunch. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I thought at we might Ritz. get a similar ending to to season one, and it was just the opposite. Yeah. Unfortunately, to be continued. That's how I kind of looked at it. Yep. I I will say I was totally caught. I was completely caught off guard by the Beelzebub Gabriel relationship. That completely Mm -hmm. like was way out of. I was just like that is not anywhere near what I would have thought was was going to happen. But I loved how we got the payoff about the fly, and at you know the bottom of the box was I am the fly, and. (laughs) we figure out that's what was in the box. You know, he, he dropped the matchbook in heaven, the matchbox in heaven. 
and left it empty there, but he brought the fly back in the box. And so that's how the fly got into the bookshop, of course. And then Beelzebub says, well, there's only one fly in this bookshop and she's, it's familiar to me, uh, you know, and it flies over to her finger. So, hmm. yeah, he doesn't have an office. What, is, <laughs> what desk does he have to clean out? He doesn't have a desk, <laughs> but yeah. All right. Well, I think that's our coverage <laughs> for five. Do we have some six. favorite quotes. I didn't go through quotes, but you're more than welcome to share. Please share. Yeah. I just threw up down a couple that I loved. Uh, like when Nina says, uh, he's, she's talking to Crowley and asking him what his relationship is to Aziraphale. And he says, is he your bit on the side? And Crowley says, he's too pure of heart to be anyone's bit on the side. <laughs> just, <laughs> it's so sweet to to realize that Crowley thinks about him that way. And then Aziraphale, when they're being invaded by the demons and he says that Crowley will be back soon. And Nina says, do you always need him to help you out? Don't you have a, a plan of your own? And Aziraphale says, I am, but receiving or rescuing me makes him so happy. <laughs> I like that. That's that was really sweet. <laughs> yeah, it was, I was trying to remember the, the ones that I've thrown out during the, during the podcast are really the only ones that stood out, stood out to me. The, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, those are great. All right. Well, Seems that's it. <laughs> this is our coverage there. Uh, I hope uh, all you listeners liked it. Uh, what what we covered, especially for this particular one, and we know it's been a long time in between. But uh, try to space it out. Sometimes life's gotten away with uh, trying to get together to do this. We're hoping not for that not to happen coming up, considering what we're going to be covering next. So we got. Well, next week, uh, September 29th, starts The Boys Gen V. So that's going to be coming out. So expect us to uh, come up and uh, and and Loki And yeah. Loki's coming out here in the, the next couple of weeks. weeks. Yeah, the next week after that. So we're going to be doing double duty for a little while. Hopefully, so, I'll be uh, healthy enough to do yeah. those deep dives into, into stuff and not be quite as casual of a conversation. But the casual conversation is good, too. Yeah, well, most likely that's what probably be wrapped into. Rob will be back. Frank might be involved, too, depending on who can or cannot show up. So obviously I'll be on, but uh, I'll be casually watching as I always will. So uh, for those who are not familiar with the boys Gen V and where it comes from, it originated from the boys volume four. We got to go now by Garth Ennis and uh, Derek Robinson. So it's based upon that series. So you could buy the trade paperback of the boys volume four, and that will be the story that they're covering within the, the new Amazon prime show, which is just entitled Gen V, but it's the boys Gen V. Mm -hmm. And then obviously season two of Loki, like we mentioned, that's coming in out in October 5th. So uh, we might do individual episodes where, you know, the boys will have their own or maybe Loki, or maybe we just combine them both just to have a casual conversation with him. Sure. But we would love for you guys to uh, send any feedback if possible. But uh, as far as, uh, well, podcast recommendations, obviously, or where we can be heard, Steve? I send my thoughts into various podcasts that our friends do, and you can hear my voice on on feedback for those those shows. Uh, I will do a little plug, and, and uh, of course, Mark, you were on. It's queued up on my podcast player. Uh, you were on Still Slaying, a Buffy uh, the Vampire, Vampire Slayer rewatch uh, podcast for Podcastica. You yep. were on the Halloween episode. Uh, they're not doing a total rewatch. They're kind of picking and choosing episodes. Specific episodes, like uh, within season two. They skip yeah. season one completely. And they'll do that for season three as well. Yeah, it was yeah. fun. Uh, still slaying a Buffy verse uh, podcast, and that can be found on the Podcastica network. All you have to do is go to podcast the pod ugh, podcastica dot com. There you could get other other uh, podcasts. The Loki verse has started with Sydney, Alex, and Kirk, so they're covering now season one of Loki to go right into season two. So check that out as well. Hear their opinions and their thoughts of season one. We did our coverage way back when, so I don't know how long ago. <laughs> it was a while. I may try to do a rewatch of Loki before, before it starts again. Uh, yeah, pretty quick. So, and uh, for me, you could hear me on adrenaline cinema podcast. I think the last thing we put out 
recently was the Prince of Darkness. But look forward to some Halloween stuff to come out because the month of Halloween is coming up. I look to do. I'm looking to do at least two Universal classics movies, as well as do Escape from New York and a couple others that I've been trying to get people because of scheduling on to do. But most of all, we're trying to gear up. Even though it's not coming in out until 2024, Lara, myself, and Danny will be covering Interview with a Vampire, the original movie version, to prep us to go into season two of Interview with a Vampire. So, you know, with that coverage. I'm excited to go back and maybe watch that first season and uh, then uh, uh, try to catch up with you guys on some feedback posts, maybe. Yeah, we just covered it as a whole, I think, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, just one whole season. Yeah, I, I didn't listen to it because I hadn't watched the hadn't watched the show, so I may may try to pick it up now since now that we're in this kind of lag of content for a bit. <laughs> I highly recommend it. I yeah. can't wait for season two. It's completely different from an Anne Rice book, in my opinion, but the the visualization is very cool and the setting that they put it in, I really admire and I like. Whether I it, it be was a good adaptation, present. an adaptation, you know, it's supposed to. Yeah, I mean, it can be cleave closely to the book but the movie did that so i like yeah. that this series is taking it in a slightly more modern direction yeah it's its own character in itself yeah. i think well for those of you too a little bit of side notes that i'm reading this i forgot to mention it when we talked about gen v mr patrick schwarzenegger is gonna be in it so that's arnie's one of arnie's son <laughs> he's gonna be in it as well as nice. jensen ackles Mm-hmm. But yeah, you could hear me on uh, Adrenaline Cinema Podcast. You could hear me right ne- here on Panels to Pixels Podcast. Also, Fantasy Picks Movie Edition with uh, Rob, Adam, Frank, and Patrick when we get all of us together. And hopefully, we get Steve and anybody else that would be interested in being on. You know, they love that idea of fantasy picks within a film or how to change a film. So, I highly recommend that. All you have to do is go to powercoreentertainment.com and just check out all the other uh, podcasts on the network there and uh, see what you like because everything has a link to it. But uh, And, Larry, you've been on a few stuff, too. You've been on Adrenaline Cinema. You've been on Panels to Pixels. You've Mm -hmm. done, what was it, Uh, The Witcher. Yep, we did the season two of The Witcher. I've been... I just pop in here and there. She pops in and out <laughs> whenever she's uh, asked to be on or when she goes, hey, hey, uh, can I be on? <laughs> and we do. Uh, most likely that'll happen during when we do season two of Sandman Cast 2 with uh, Jamie and I. So that can be found on Podcast Network as well. And whenever Interview with the Vampire, the series comes back. Hopefully yep. I'll be on as a regular with you and Danny. Yep, we're going to try to do it episodically this time, so that way we'll do it episode by episode, so give each episode its uh, duly credit and information that we uh, we pick out for it. But yeah, other than that, like I said earlier, if you uh, we like feedback, so uh, if you liked what you heard here or any of the previous podcasts that we've done, all you have to do is literally go to our Facebook group, which would be facebook.com forward slash panels to pixels. Sometimes I post things, but you can easily just reach us, uh, reach out to us. I'll post a, an image and then saying, hey, leave your comments and, and your thoughts below. I'll probably be doing that with Loki and with uh, with Gen V when that comes out more regularly. Same thing with Adrenaline Cinema Podcast as well. But you can email us at panels to pixels one. That's panels to spelled out T-O, pixels and the number one at gmail.com. You can send us a regular texted email if you want. Just, you know writing out your thoughts we'll read it and what you could always always do if you like all you have to do is just record your voice and send it as an attachment and we'll play it but obviously this was kind of short notice and we just threw this together and here we are but uh i could promise you that uh, we will play it if we get it we also get it from youtube as well so all you have to do is find us on youtube and just search panels to pixels podcast while you're there subscribe give us a thumbs up and obviously Hit that bell just so that way any new content comes up, it'll alert you or it'll be in your queue the next time you're on your uh, Apple TV or whatever device that you use to watch YouTube. Uh, A lot of people like to listen to their podcasts that way, I find. 
Uh, mm. I've had quite a few because when I start seeing like it's 70 people have watched the video, I'm I'm like, wait a minute, that's that's odd. But mm -hmm. it's some people do. And I always hit a like so that way it gets somebody interested. So just to cap them. So it's not me liking my stuff myself. Sorry. I just like to have to check it to give it a thumbs up so people could actually see it as something as a suggestion. We are on Instagram as well. And usually a lot of the times I like to do is when the episode is out, I like to put it on Instagram because a lot of people see it and they like it. And then I put all the links into it, especially with celebrities, whenever we mention their name or anybody that's in a movie or show. So all you have to do is look for at panels to pixels podcast. And then with that, you can just, you know, just like and follow the, uh, the page. And then whenever a new episode is out, you can just do that. Or it's the best, you know, like, Getting word of mouth is the best way, and you can show it to a friend. Say, hey, I listen to this podcast. I highly recommend you you do that as well. And then if they ask you where we could be found, you just say, hey, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Deezer, whatever. There's, they're all over there. Spotify. Spotify is probably one of the bigger ones as well as Apple Podcasts. So uh, if you guys are listening with those particular apps, please give us uh, a rating or review, especially Apple podcasts. And uh, uh, if you could give us a five, it'd be really appreciated. If you don't, that's fine as well, but uh, just give us a review rating review. It'd be awesome. But well, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank everybody for listening. I'm Mark. I'm Steve. And I'm Laura. Same podcast, different panel, different pixel. This was panels of pixels. And we'll see you all on the next panel. Good night, everybody. See you later. Good night. <laughs>